Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions, woo, and we answer. I am joined, as always, by my beautiful, stunning, intelligent, exquisite, and just adorable co-host, Kristen Williams. Uh, if you guys wonder why I do this every week, <laughs> that's it right there. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Right. I'll just, be, I will be, I will always be your ride or die. You know that. I know. We were just talking about how much we love each other. I it's, know. Uh, it's so great. ride or die for sure. All right. Do you want me to get started? Yeah. You can start with the first one. All right. Right. Great. I will start with a question that was sent in from our friend over in London, Gila. She says, I've got a question for the pod. My question is about my partner who recently developed pain in the front inside of his knee. He has just started training for a half marathon and after just a couple of runs, uh, he noticed the pain while he was running. He cycles, plays squash and football, and I think quite importantly is a photographer, which means he often finds himself in awkward positions trying to get the shot. For example, he often has to lower his body into a kind of low lunge with the bottom knee hovering and then stays there for a while while he shoots. He has an inkling that some of these awkward positions might have something to do with the knee pain. I think it's also too important to note that in early 2021, he fell playing football and the fatty tissue of his knee was swollen for five months. I thought it would be a good idea to ask, number one, where you think the supposed pain might be coming from, and number two, any ideas for him to continue training for the half marathon without encouraging more pain or at worst, creating further injury. Hmm. So... You know, there's nothing worse than when you're training for a run and your your knee starts bothering him you know, or bothering you. I did reach out to her and I said, you know, asked him, asked her, what was he doing for training? She said, literally, this was like the second run. So he, it's not like he was over training or because that's like, a, like a, I think a more typical answer yeah. that we find is, well, we look and somebody goes, I'm going to run a half marathon. And then they go balls to the wall. And then their knees hurt. Like, that's a no-brainer. Same thing happened to me my first marathon that I trained for. I did a six-day-a-week running program. It was just too much for my body, and I had knee pain. So now I know I don't do that type of training. But this does not apply to her partner. Um, and I do, I love that she gave us all the extra mm -hmm. information about the fatty um, tissue of the knee where he had the, the incident in 2021, so roughly two years ago, and the background of being a photographer. Like, what's the first thing that comes to your mind with that, Lara? Well, the I, you know, when at first she was saying all the things he was doing, I was like, oh, it's sagittal plane. And then when she said football, well, that's soccer, you know. So for us Americans, that's soccer. And that immediately, um, my antenna went up. And the main reason is there's a lot of cutting. There's a lot of cutting, quick um, stopping. And, and the fact then at the very end, she said there was an injury. So my gut is that... Um, you know, your your knees are meant to kind of just translate energy from the ground and then into the hip. And they do absorb they do absorb some of the energy, especially when you're talking about running. I mean, there's all those I don't know the exact stats, but it's like walking versus running. It's like two and a half times more load. So if his mechanics are even a little bit not as great the knee might be um, feeling it. And especially if there had been some kind of meniscal injury, um, the meniscus are basically cartilaginous structures that help cushion and, and absorb that two and a half pounds with every step you're taking. So my instinct would be, okay, it sounds, especially that anterior part of the knee, um, you know, if it was like in the kneecap or above it, but like on the side, that medial side, that's right where the medial meniscus would be lying and where a lot of people, when they've had meniscal injuries, and it could be, you can just tear a little bit of it and still be able to do a lot of things, but it might come up when it's being stressed. You know, it doesn't have the same absorbing qualities. Or he might have, like, you know, um, innately, subconsciously done something to walk a little differently, you know, because of that. I mean, our bodies are so smart we we will will make up for it you know if you've ever hurt something um whether it's your toe or your hip or your knee and it's hurt for a little bit of time during that time you continue often to move but you will move in ways to unburden it so i would love to see him a move like how is he hip hinging how is he 
Um, how, what is his, I, I would really recommend going to a running coach that really understands biomechanics and see like, how is he landing? If he's landing and really translating a lot of that anterior force forward, it does go into the tibia some, but it's going to go into the knee and into that meniscus. And um, that could be irritating it. This, the, and they're like, what's the surface you're running on? Yes. That's huge. Like if you're running on concrete, don't do it. That's just a lot of pounding that's not getting the spring back that we want. Um, so I would look at like, you know, like footwear. Uh, is he running in a circle? Is he running in just the direct, like the slope of the road? You know, if he's running with that side and the inner knee, like if he, that side's on the top and it's always going to pushing down. All of these things um, can add up, especially if there is some underlying, you know, insult. Well, especially like, you know, you said, I mean, we know he's playing soccer, football, and is not having it or apparently, you know, is not having any issues. And then all of a sudden he does something like running. Well, what's different? You know, yes, it's straight sagittal the whole time. Um, and then, like you said, I love that you brought up the surface. You know, what is it's not grass. I would guess he's probably running, especially if they live in in central London. I mean, good heavens, you know, cobblestones and crown roads. So, you know, things like that. I have definitely with, you know, with my running history, if I find that I'm better off if I run where I can switch sides of the road. So I try to run at non-busy times so I can always change up the crowning if I can't run down the straight center of the road because that over time will bother knees. And and then, yeah, the fact that he's kneeling in funny positions for prolonged periods is, you know, can be kind of you know, laying the groundwork for that it not taking much to aggravate things. But I agree with you 100%. Look to see, how, you know, how he's running. Look at his gait. Is, are the knees falling in? Is he mm -hmm. keeping a nice window between the knees or are they collapsing in? Which is why he might be getting that medial, you know, pain, especially, you know, when he's just going straight. Because when you're going side to side, I think you do tend to kind of keep a little bit more open window between the knees versus when you're just going straight ahead. I think they could be more collapsing in. So... Um, yeah, and shorten maybe shorten the stride. Sometimes you overstride, which uh, is not as efficient, and you and also can burden the knee more. So maybe, um, but I would I would definitely recommend like seeing somebody. The right. other thing is, um, like you were referencing before, when you were doing the six days a week, you, you know, you don't have to run every day. You can run two short days and then start to build up one longer day. Um, during the weekend or, or whatever time that works for you, that can be as efficient as doing six days a week of running. So all all of those things. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that's what I do for my for my half marathons. It's just it's just three days. Two yeah. short, but long. Yeah. Um, marathon, I do four, but still, that's it. That's all I need. All, all right. right. You want to go to Over Rita's next? Rita's question? Yeah. Do you have it? Yeah, I can pull it up here. I also all have right. it. Yeah. You Our go ahead. Our friend Rita who lives in France, she wrote us and she says, in all lit classes, we do spinal, and she puts in parentheses, I mean all segments of the spine, rotation, whether it's in the reset, in supine, or in sequences. Over the last year, I have heard from a few students that their osteopath or physio or even integrative doctors are telling them to practice these rotational movements sparingly as they lead to build up sometimes more tension in the body than the benefit we usually credit them. Not in lit, by the way. Have you heard of any similar recommendations or client feedback? Would love to hear your thoughts. Mm, uh, that sounds bizarre to me. Um, the only time I can think of limiting thoracic rotation is if there is like a fracture or if there is um, osteopenia and, the, and certain types of forceful rotations would... but. Rotation is, I mean, done well is, is very important. It's, it's vital for the um, nutrients. You know, when you, when you move the spine, you're pulling in nutrients to give to the disc. They, 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 need, they deserve it and they need it um, to the cartilage uh, because the, the structures of the spine between the, uh, the vertebra, not the facet joints, those are cartilaginous. So cartilaginous, then we know they're mostly made, like we were talking about with the knee, for a lot of like absorbing shock and um, giving some space. You don't necessarily move as much in cartilaginous joints. We're really moving a lot 
or we're hold. That's why we emphasize the triple S because we hold that structure so that energy can flow through it. But you do need that mobility. And then that goes out into all the tissues. So if you're not moving, actually, I feel like if my, if the, if I have personal um, tension in my back fascia or anybody I'm working with, one of the things I do the most is side bending and rotation. It's like milking the tissue to free it up as opposed to like forward fold and just laying there thinking that's going to change is not. Those are very, that that is really, really dense, um, strong fascia. And so you actually have to kind of, it's like dough. You, you don't just like push it down. You have to kind of mold it a little bit. And that m- movement is generated hopefully from more of the proximal areas controlled as well. But that is actually going to, I think, better balance out those tissues. So I don't understand that reasoning, but maybe you have a different thought on that. Well, if I had to guess, I would think that they are, whoever's saying this, doctors, physios, they are imagining what a more traditional yoga practice does, which mm. is that cranking into the rotation. Forceful. There's a lot of that where it's inhale, exhale, take yourself further, inhale, go a little further. That There are issues with that. You know, I mean, we, and, and so in, in lit, that's not how we do it. You know, we do it active rotation, that like milking, like you're saying. And so um, I, and if you think about human beings, when we're little, we're moving all over, we're wiggling, we're rotating. When we get older, we become much more sedentary and we lose that mobility in our spine. I mean, it is, if, if I had a dollar for the number of people that, that I see in clinic, in the studio who are limited in thoracolumbar rotation, I would be a wealthy, wealthy woman. I would say 90% of people are limited because we don't move that way anymore actively. Mm -hmm. So then you go to a yoga class where suddenly they have you putting your elbow on the outside of your thigh and pushing to bring your thumbs to your... It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So I think there's that preconceived idea of what these... And and, and I say to people, don't do that. (laughs) You know, there's... Oh, yeah. do it actively like we do in the lit method. I will hold a stretch, but I'm never pulling into it. So I'll do things active. I'll say, all right, just hold right where you feel comfortable and just use your breath to let those, like you said, the breath can just milk those soft tissues because 90% of people need that. We need to open up in the rib cage. You know, those intercostals get super tight. The, the QL and the back body gets super tight. The people lose this mobility. So yeah, that's what I think. My guess is they are thinking about traditional yoga. So that's who I think it sounds like she's probably hearing this from people who have hurt themselves. Um, and that would make sense. A lot of other things. professionals uh, are not keen on yoga because of that. That that they it's it's a um, like you said it's a passive and you're going beyond. So active, it's a measure of how much you can do on your own and versus passive, you are using an outside force. And that not only is not great for, uh, the, you know, the, the soft tissue structures, the restraint structures, but it's just, yeah, for those other bigger, you know, muscles and, um, fascia, it's not great for them either. I'm thinking about that little toy where you, you hold it and you go like this on the, on the wooden part. And it has like I forgot what it is, but it, but it spins this, and it's like that's how it, it is. You're, yeah, it's like your spine. You're doing this that creates this versus I'm not taking this and moving. So it's like you create the movement from the actual origin, and then that lights that makes it seem like it's a bigger movement eventually. But you don't you don't reverse engineer it because that's when you run into that trouble. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Now she had one more question, didn't she? She did. Um, her second question was, in some classes, yoga, meditation, et cetera, there's an invitation to observe where we feel that our body might hold tension. One of my students, 56, had rotator cuff surgery a few years back, and I noticed that I keep reminding her a couple times to relax her right shoulder, not in overhead flexion, LOL. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a lit joke. Um, she said that she feels like her shoulder got stuck in a sort of defensive position 
that translates in this tensed up way of holding as it was before the surgery. And also since then, she was inwardly thinking, oh, I don't want to hurt my shoulder. I should be careful with my shoulder, etc." I feel like there might be something to it as it seems really unconscious, but I was also wondering if it's also related to suboptimal posture habits and brain wiring. I appreciate if you'd share, how does this sound to you? You want to start off? So, yeah, you know, I think what she's she's asking is, um, do people hold tension in the body after an injury? And I think absolutely. We see this, especially after a surgery where, or like a shoulder where you've been in a sling, if you've had ankle surgery, you've been in a boot, if you've had knee surgery, you've either been in a brace or swollen, your body starts to forget what quote unquote normal is. And this protective posturing becomes the new normal. And there does start, you get this faulty wiring um, where the body doesn't recognize that that's not where it should be. And we will default to that. And I think absolutely protective posturing, we see it um, just in, in, in people's emotions. When, when, when people are, are scared, when they're frightened, when they're sad, they come into a very closed fetal type position. When they are pumped up and excited, it is boom, I am up, I'm ready to go. So after you've had an injury, you're very protective and and that can be really really tough to retrain and so the first thing like rita what you're doing what you're reminding her hey drop that shoulder it she doesn't even know and it's oh my goodness and the more we can let people recognize things on the mat it helps them recognize things off the mat where oh yeah you know Kristen pointed out in class today that i was doing this and then and then they'll they'll suddenly see themselves, you know, doing that. And and I find that I have to do that with myself, or you know, maybe not after an, in, in, an injury, but just in general. I, I was talking about this in my movement lab this this week. I was running on the treadmill, and I um and I've got this uh, it was I was inside obviously, and I've got a window to my left, and then to my right is this like reflective um, hutch, and so I could see myself in the reflection. And I just noticed that with my right shoulder that I was just here. And I, and I couldn't feel it. And I was like, oh, and I just kind of drew my posture back better that I didn't even realize that I was doing that. And this is my right shoulder that I'm a little protective of. And it's just, it goes into that protective posturing. And all I had to do was recognize it and draw it back. And so I find myself doing that throughout the day with this right shoulder, just, all right, get get back there. You don't have to do that. Well, You're fine. Like I'm no. taking my shoulder. You're fine. Just, just chill out. And you know, so yes, you're absolutely right. We see that a lot. Um, what else do you have to add to that, Laura? Yeah. I mean, I think it kind of poses an interesting question, which is our brain is highly persuadable. And in that investigation, I would actually reframe it. I, I think instead of being like, notice where you're holding tension, it could be like, Think about where you want to bring more space. So it's because when we we don't want to re we don't want to reinforce something that already might be there. It's just a suggestion. I just sometimes think that our language is so important, and I've just noticed that throughout the years of hearing different prompts and yoga and whatnot. It's like we really it isn't saying that we never tell people this is this is what you don't want to do, like we don't want to hold tension there. That's fine. But how about reframing it and being like, as you're, as you're stand, you know, sitting here, where do you want to bring more space? I love that. You know, and because that person's already kind of fire, like wired to be um, nervous about that. And let me give a short example. We were in Costa Rica and one of our lit teachers was there and she was doing modified side plank and was doing it in that way, you know, where it's like you take up the mo you, you instead of being in line, like with the, the long edge of the mat, her forearm was down. It was it was in line with the short edge of the mat. So you have a larger base of support. And I said, you know, why don't you try it this way? And she did. And late and afterwards, she's like, Laura, I haven't done that in like two years since I since I sublux my shoulder. And now it just feels really warm. Is that OK? And I was like, that's great. That's just it's awake. It's alive. You know, it's like good like and but she had anticipated she would injure it so I think we have to once you know it's not being like 
totally fear less, but it's like fearing less. Like we are strong. And so she needs to start realizing that rotator cuff, all the things you're doing is going to help it. And it might take more time to set up things. And that over time will will be the actual kind of blanket that she needs so she's not guarding. So those are my only suggestions. It's just like kind of reframe um, maybe that idea of like, okay, this doesn't need to be held as much anymore. Uh, maybe give another cue of like pull that scapula into the spine more so that, that that'll help align it. And that also will probably bring it down naturally. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of running and triple S, someone did ask me, um, let's see, M M H S Gemini 37. Hi, Laura. I love your work on the q and I'm wondering if you and Kristen can talk about neutral pelvis, triple S while walking, running, et cetera. How does it work when one has to look down to avoid tripping on things or falling on une- uneven ground? Mom of young children here. Smiley face. Um, yeah. I love that. Well, I mean, I, I know have... as a longtime runner, um, I even kind of think of myself as like a, a, you know, lit has really opened my eyes to what running did to my body and there's many many positive benefits to running but you know my my area of discomfort would mostly be my low back and it was you know when I first started coming to Laura to your studio way back when I was so tight in that you know in in my low back because when you run and I'm a I've got a longer stride um more of a shuffler like I'm not um I don't have much hip flexion when I run, a lot of hip extension. And so what's going to happen? You know, I'm I'm going to I'm going to dump into my pelvis and go into my low back and um that that has really made me aware I'm since I've started lit and been doing lit religiously for many years now, I'm much more aware. Just like I said, I was looking at myself in the mirror to look to see I'll look at my pelvis and I was shocked by my shoulder because I I have changed my gait pattern and and I feel so much better in my body. You know, it is a shorter stride, more, you know, hip flexion. So I'm not going to so much hip extension. And I'm thinking about, you know, where, to your point from the last question, where do I need more space? For me, it's in my low back. And the way I get that is by getting my knees up, you know, not constantly leaving my legs behind me, so to speak, you know? And so, uh, and, and when we're talking about distance running versus sprinting, you know, it's, they're two different beasts and it also depends per person I, you know, I think it's it's been interesting you know watching some I love to watch the Olympic track and field and and, and, and if you really look at the, these you know these world-class athletes they all run differently and they're all built differently so there's no specific way to say you should run upright you know you should lean forward when you're sprinting you know I think there is more of that per se but, but they're um, still in triple S. So triple S doesn't mean you actually S. have to yeah. be vertical. It can be just the relationship of those points. And you'll see those sprinters, they're in it. They're hinged, but they're not rounded or it, you know, they have that triple S. It's crazy. I mean, I I was um just on Instagram the other day, saw this. Uh I she's a triathlete. I think she's from Australia. And I saw something about they said I could never walk against. She had a herniated disc. I don't know why. But in her rehab, then I see the pull like we use in triple S and she's doing squats with that. And then I just go down the page and she's like running with triple S and she's getting faster than ever before her. It's it's incredible that she's doing endurance, um, but she's also freaking fast. And her name is escaping me right now, but just look up Australian like endurance runner. And her form is like amazing. It's really, you just see because it's regenerative. Like her legs are working and it's just yep. that spine is like she is aligned. So in answer to your question about, yeah, that, does that mean you never look down or never like look up or look to the side? You know, that's going to happen. You, you'll, you'll do that. You can also be running and gazing ahead in front of you on the, you know, that's what I would do when I would run in very uneven sidewalks in Princeton because I tripped one time and I learned like, don't do that again. Uh, so just gaze in front of you, but you don't have to take your whole torso down. And, yeah. and you know, the whole idea with triple S is that in life, you're going to come out of it. That's fine. It's that does your brain understand how to stabilize that to produce forces with your limbs? Because that's really what you're doing is creating the yeah. big movement there 
that is then um, taken into the triple S and not lost. So it's, I think that's, that's your answer. And I hope that helps. <laughs> I hope so too. All right, everybody, as usual, we love all these questions. Make sure you write us. You can write us on Instagram, Laura.Hyman, KBWilliams99. Um, you can also write on the Redefining Yoga podcast, um, write on our, our profile page there. Please follow it as well and share it with friends. Yep. You can also just send us an email, a good old fashioned email, support at lityoga.com. Those get forwarded to us. We have a little folder in our in our email. That's what these these last questions were emails to us. And so, you know, and really nothing's off the table. We, we, we're, we're, we're giving our opinion based on years of experience, but, um, you know, people write in with everything from body questions to life questions. Yes. Whatever you got, you, you know, if you want to know our take on it, we're happy to give it to you. We are. We're so grateful for you all. And so make sure that you please rate, subscribe, review, and share the podcast because we want to keep doing this for a long time. Because we love each other and we love uh, just chatting about it. So thank you. And as always, we're pulling for you. We're pulling for you. For you.